Hey, and welcome. So this is intended for physics or AP physics students. You may be at the point of the year where you have to learn how to do two-dimensional electric field problems. There's actually a lot to it, so please pay close attention, but you can do this. You can all do this as long as you follow the strategies I'm going to show you. The problem that I made up here says this, two-point charges of positive 4.5 microcoulombs and a negative 1.23 microcoulombs are separated by 6 meters on a number line. What is the electric field produced from these charges 3 meters below the second charge in the y-axis? So that's the setup to the problem. Initially, I do want to point out you do have two equations for the electric field that you can work with. This equation on the left is derived from Coulomb's law over here. And this over here is the sort of definition of an electric field. That would be the force experienced by a small positive test charge put at a point divided by its own charge. So it's independent of whatever charge we put here. And your first decision is to decide which equation are we going to use. The strategy that I've previously gone over is to think to yourself, all right, is the problem asking about forces or has it given me a force? And if the answer is yes, use this equation. And if the answer is no, use this equation over here. So for this problem, what do you think we're going to use? We're going to use the equation on the left because there is no force that's mentioned nor given. And so we can just start with this equation over here. Next up, I want you to start anticipating what is going to be the direction of these vectors. These electric fields are vectors. You can see the vector notation up here. And the question is, what will be the direction of those vectors at that point? So at this point here, from Q1, is this going to be an attractive or repulsive electric field? And the way I want you to think about this is, remember, we're going to assume our small test charge is going to be what? Positive or negative? In other words, what would I assume we would put right here? A positive charge or a negative charge? Hopefully, if you've seen my other screencast or learned a little bit about this, you know that we're going to assume a small positive test charge always. So if that's the case, what do two positive charges do to each other? They repel each other. And so our very first vector that we could solve for and draw on our diagram is going to be this, the electric field at the point P from 1 as caused by charge 1. And the second vector, I want you to think about these two are now in a vertical line right here. And so you've got this charge and its effect on point P. So remember, we're assuming a small positive test charge. So is that electric field going to be going up or down? What do you think? The answer in this case is going to be going up. Why is that? Hopefully you can see at this point right here, if we assume a small positive test charge, it's going to be attracted to the negative charge of Q2. And so that's what we have going on here. All right. I do want to point out I'm going to be giving you strategies throughout this problem and making references to those strategies. The first two strategies are here, and I'm going to show you an overview next of how we're going to approach these problems. So here are your strategies. At this point, this is a lot of text. It's just a wall of text. I do want to point out as we go, I will cover them. So number one and number two, make your diagram, add your given values. Secondly, figure out which equation you're going to be using for this problem. You essentially have two choices. So we have done those two things. Those are easy to cover now. I'm going to go through the rest of these, and then I'm going to give you these strategies at the end of the screencast as well because part of this is just keeping track of everything that we're doing. These problems are involved, they take time, they take effort, and so keeping track of all of your strategies throughout these problems is a challenge, but you can do this. All right, so we go back to our diagram here, and let's think about what we're going to be doing. So we want to solve for this value right here, for this electric field on point P from 1. We'll just start with 1 because that's our first charge. And we work with this equation here, and immediately we run into a roadblock. Can you spot the roadblock? Yep, we don't know what our R value is. We don't know what this distance is between these two. But think about how you would solve that. It turns out that this is a right triangle. And if we know the distance of this leg is 6 meters, the distance of this leg is 3 meters, then we can just quickly draw a right triangle and use the Pythagorean theorem to be able to solve for that R value, that distance in between Q1 and P. And we do that, and we end up with 6.71 meters. Okay, and so now we go back, and we're going to be able to plug in that 6.71 meters into the equation and we solve for the electric field at point P as caused by Q1, and that's going to be 910 newtons per coulomb. First of all, newtons per coulomb can help you to understand what we're talking about when we talk about an electric field. 
That means what would be the force experienced by something if you placed it a certain place in three-dimensional space divided by the coulomb, so per unit coulomb. So at this point right here, you would say from Q1, the electric field that's caused would be 910 newtons if we put one coulomb of charge at that point P. That's what we're saying by this. And when in doubt, look at your units. If you're not quite sure what some of these ideas are, look at your units. Next up, I do want to point out our strategy here. It says solve for the electric field for the point in space you are asked to work with from one charge. Treat them initially like the point and charge are in a line. Then do the same for the other charge. In other words, we're just going to assume these are in a line. They are in a way. They're not in the positive x-axis or positive y-axis, but they are just two points that you could say are in a line in space. So that's how we do this first part. And the second part is really just more of the same. I do want you to think about this right here. So your EP2, we're solving for this right here by plugging the values in. We've got a minus 1.23. So I do want to point out that at the beginning of this problem right here, we do have a negative value. This negative value is going to give us a negative answer. And that's at the beginning of the problem. And that just means that there is an attractive force, or there would be if we placed a small positive test charge right here, it would be attracted to Q2 in terms of its effects from Q2, you could say. That's why we get the negative sign here. Later in the problem, that is going to be changed, though. And if you don't know what I'm talking about in terms of signs, meaning something at the beginning of the problem and something else towards the end of the problem, I think you should watch a screencast I've done that covers this material. Hopefully you're comfortable with me saying that. So at this point, we'll make it a negative and get a negative answer. Later, we're going to change that. So I'm going to put a link to that previous screencast now. And speaking of previous screencasts, I do want to point out that I do think you should know how to do the head-to-tail vector addition strategy. If you don't, I've done a screencast on that because we're going to be using that here. So I will put a link to that screencast as well. Hopefully you're up to speed at this point with that. If you need to pause so you can read these instructions and strategies to get the idea of how you would approach this, then go for it. But I'm going to show you this in practice as well. All right, our fourth step is going to be to break down one or both electric vectors into components if those electric fields are not completely in the x or the y axis. Well, this right here, EP2, is completely in the y axis, so we don't need to break it down into triangles or do anything with that. This right here is not completely in the x or the y axis, and because of that, we need to break it into its parts or components because we cannot add just two vectors. In this case, we couldn't subtract these two vectors and get a result, and that would make sense unless we break it up into its parts. So let's go ahead and do that. First of all, notice that this triangle right here has an angle, and that is going to be the same as this angle over here. These are similar triangles is one way to reason through that. Another way is probably some geometry proof that you may or may not remember. But in any case, hopefully you can just spot the idea that this angle is going to be the same as this angle. And we want to get this angle over here because we want to work with this vector right here. And so to get that angle, we can just go ahead, start with this leg, this leg. We also happen to know the hypotenuse. And we can start to use an inverse trig function. So I'm going to just start with tangent here. Tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. And what I'm going to do is take the arctangent or inverse tangent of both sides. If I do that, that gets rid of this tangent function. Why am I doing that? because we're interested in this theta value. We're not interested in the tangent of theta. We want to know what theta is. So I take the inverse tangent or arc tangent of both sides, and I continue with the math and throw in some numbers. I end up with 26.6 degrees. We now know what this angle is, and by extension, this angle as well. And we want that so we can work more closely with that vector. Okay, and so let's work with that. So we've got EP1 and the X and EP1 and the Y. And this is going to be EP1. We now know what this value is, 26.6. So the question is, can we solve for this and this if we know our angle and we know this value? And the answer is yes. So that's what we're going to be doing next. We're going to do some simple math as well to solve for the other leg of the triangle. So we've taken step four of our strategies where it says break down one or both electric vectors and the components if those electric fields are not completely in the x or the y axis. So hopefully that now makes sense. We've solved for this and we've solved for this and we're going to use those in coming up with the sum of the vectors in the x and sum of the vectors in the y. That's where we're going with this. And so I wrote that out for our fifth step. It says add the vectors in the x and the y axis together to get the sum of the vectors in the x 
and the sum of the vectors in the y. So we start with this, the sum of the vectors in the x. Well, this first vector right here does have an x component. So this red vector does have an x component. Does the second vector have an x component? The answer is no, it doesn't. And so you do have this, and we solved for that value earlier. This is just zero because no part of it is in the x-axis, you could say. All right, so we go ahead and add our numbers together. We end up with 814 newtons of coulomb. Let's do the same thing for the y-axis. This is going to get a little trickier, so I want you to pay close attention. The sum of the vectors in the y is equal to the vector p1y, p2y. Let's think about this. This one is going up. This component is going down. Does that matter? The answer is yes, that does matter. So what does that mean? Well, if we go back here, so yes, this does matter. I'm going to go ahead and make this negative. Why am I making this negative here? Now we're talking about negative in terms of direction in the y-axis. So part of this vector is in the negative y-plane. We have to account for that. This is going to be made into a positive number. You may or may not remember this, but we originally had a negative number for our answer to this. We're going to make it a positive. Why are we doing that? Well, again, we want to account for direction. So at the beginning of these problems, positive and negative show whether something just has simply a positive or a negative charge. And towards the end of these problems, positive and negative mean direction. So that is also something I covered in a previous screencast. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, you can take a look at the screencast that leads into this one. All right, so let's continue. I am pointing out these signs here. Very important that you get these signs correctly. You go ahead and do the math. You end up with 823 newtons of coulomb. All right, and here's where conceptually we need to understand how to do the head-to-tail method of vector addition. So we're going to draw a new right triangle using the sum of the vectors in the x, sum of the vectors in the y as the legs of the triangle. And so we have this vector here, this vector. Those are our original vectors, and we'll get to we'll get to this strategy in a moment. So these are our two original vectors. If I use the head-to-tail method, then I start here, I end here, and my resultant vector is here. This will give us our answer. In other words, we want this, which is the sum of those two vectors. As long as you have the head of one vector to the tail of another vector, it will make sense. In fact, it doesn't matter which order you do this. You could have added this vector first, and then this vector second, and you still end up with the same resultant vector over here. That's what we mean by the head-to-tail method of vector addition. Because if you just leave it like this, let's say you try to solve for this resultant value right here, that will not make sense. You have to use the head-to-tail method of vector addition. And so let's continue with this. So I've got a new triangle I can make to show the vector value. So we don't know what this is, but we do know this would be the sum of the vectors in the x-axis. This would be the sum of the vectors in the y-axis. So how would we go about solving if we know two legs of a right triangle and we want the hypotenuse? How would we go about solving for that? So pretty easy. What you're going to be doing is using the Pythagorean theorem, of course. So you go ahead, plug in your numbers here, and you end up with this answer. So this is our answer for our final vector, and that is our answer to the problem. There is one more optional step that I do want to cover because sometimes you will see it in problems. All right, and so one more thing that you should be able to do. It says, if needed, solve for the angle using arctangent or an inverse trig function. So what does that mean? That means we sometimes want to look for this angle right here, or you could show it in this diagram right here with some reference line like above the positive x-axis or above the horizon or something like that. They want to know what the angle is involved for this triangle. I've labeled that here as what we're solving for. We go ahead, we can start with, say, tangent. You can do this with any of the trig functions as long as you know your hypotenuse, though. I'll just use tangent, though, since we have that handy. We have the opposite and the adjacent. We are not interested in the tangent of this angle. We actually want to get this angle by itself. So to get this angle by itself, to isolate our unknown, we take the inverse tangent or arc tangent of both sides. What that does is cancels out the tangent function over here. You're left with theta final over here is equal to the inverse or arctangent of this. We go ahead and plug in our numbers, and we end up with an angle of 44.7 degrees. So that's how you would go about doing this. This is a challenging problem. Hopefully you are able to follow along with this. If you are not, I suggest maybe watching this a second time. I do want to finish, though, with the strategies, so you can review and take a look at the strategies that we did use for this.
All right, so let's take a look at our strategies. First off, we make a diagram, add our given values. Second, decide which equation to use. Remember I said that depends on whether or not you have the electric force in there or you're asked for the force. Third, solve for the electric field in space you're asked for. So do that for every point you have. If you have a Q1, Q2, however many Qs you have, you run that equation and solve for that value. Fourth, you're going to break down those answers into components if the fields are not completely in the x to the y axis. Fifth, add the vectors in the x and the y axis together to get the sum of the vectors in the x and the sum of the vectors in the y. Sixth, draw a new right triangle using the sum of the vectors in the x and the sum of the vectors in the y as the legs of the triangle and the head to tail method and solve for the hypotenuse as the sum of the vectors total. If needed, solve for the angle using arctangent or an inverse trig function. So that's overall how you would approach these problems. These problems are a challenge. If you practice them, though, they will become easy. Part of the problem is it's a multi-step problem, so just be careful as you go to not make errors along the way. Hopefully this has been helpful. I'm going to be doing more screencasts in this series as I talk about an electricity unit. So if you would like to listen to more, please do so. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.